I'm Araceli with ECTV. On today's show, Allison Lack will be talking with Tom Gardner, musician and fanzine writer for Backdoor Man, about what it was like to be on the top cutting edge of punk music. Hi, I'm Allison Lack with ECTV, and today I'll be talking to Tom Gardner, musician and former writer for the LA based rock fanzine, Backdoor Man. Hi. Hello, Allison. How are you doing today? Very well. Good, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. I'd like to start off by asking you, can you tell me just a little bit about yourself and what you do? Well, I'm retired, so I don't have to do very much anymore. But uh, I, I buy and sell CDs and records. I play in a band. I collect records. I listen to music. And uh, I go see live music. Awesome. So where did your journey with music start? Well, that was a very long time ago. Uh, probably, honestly, with the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in 1964, and uh, then everything that came after that, which was a huge uh, revolution at the time. Yeah, would you say that your music taste evolved a lot as you grew, or did it stay oh, kind no. of the same? Absolutely, absolutely. It, I, I listen to all kinds of different music these days. Awesome. So, what drew you to the music that you like to listen to specifically? You know, that's a hard question to answer. I, I was eight when, or seven when I first really got into music. I had older brothers and sisters so who were in high school and such at the time, and so they were very into music, so I got to hear what they played. But I was addicted to the radio when I was a kid, and I bought my first record when I was eight, nine. Uh, and have been buying them ever since. So um, about writing, you were a journalist for some time. Was writing something that you always were kind of interested in? No, and I would hesitate to call myself a journalist. I was a, a fan writing for a fanzine, writing rather poorly, if I'm honest, but having fun and, uh, and um, having a lot of attitude and... Um, being willing to do it, to put myself out there. Definitely, yeah. Passion is just as important as grammar when it comes to writing. Indeed. So you started out with the fanzine Backdoor Man. What was the state of L.A.'s music scene at that time? There was none, and that's why the magazine started. Uh, friends and I, I was, when I was about 16, I met several friends, several people who were college age, who were... When I was in high school, I was into bands like Iggy and the Stooges and the MC5 and the Velvet Underground and things of that nature, and I was the only one who was. And um, I ended up meeting some people who were much older than me but were into that, and that became my group of friends. And we all started forming bands, uh, influenced by bands like the Stooges and the MC5, pre-punk, but definitely what became punk and um, all the bands had broken up and my a good friend of mine named Freddie who started the magazine uh, came to me and said we want to start a magazine would you come with us and do it and I said sure I mean what, why not because like I said all our bands had broken up we had really not much else to do and it was something to do and uh, it was quite an adventure. <laughs> Yeah, did you have any idea what it would become when you first started it? Oh, goodness, no. And and it it never, I mean, we went from printing probably 300 copies of the first issue to, I don't know, three or 5,000 of the last one. Uh, we did 15 issues in about three years. It came out when we had the money to put it out, so it wasn't very regular. And uh, I don't know that we knew what it, became until years later you know that we that we really realized what had what had occurred definitely so where did the name backdoor man come from well at the time one of the huge big music magazines was rolling stone which was named after an old blues song so we named it after a different old blues song also a song that our, one of our favorite bands the doors covered this was in the 70s, right? Oh, indeed. 19, we did the magazine from 1975 till 1978, so we were about two years before punk. 
Yeah, so really on the cutting edge for sure. And so, uh, but again, we didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So who were you working with um, when creating this? Uh, several good friends who I'd been in bands with um, and who we were all just passionate music fans, big record collectors, um, some of us musicians, some of us not, some of us actual writers, some of us not. And uh, there were seven or eight of us, and we just... Um, We'd start writing stuff. We would type it. It was all typewritten, Xeroxed, and then taken to a printer. And it was a very, um, it was a DIY experience. How did you publish this fanzine? This is El Camino High School, right? And where I grew up, there was El Camino Junior College. And we would actually, we wrote the whole thing. Everyone would turn in their writing. And none of us had typewriters. And few of us even knew how to type. But two of us knew how to type, and I was not one of them. Uh, and we would go to El Camino College where you could rent a typewriter for 10 cents an hour or whatever it was, a dollar an hour. And they would sit and type the whole thing out and try to lay it out in columns and stuff. And uh, and then find a printer somewhere who would print it for us. And it was just that basic. Was it hard to find people who would print it? Very often, yes. We were, um, I guess you would today call it not politically correct. Then you just called it humor. Um, and we were, we were actually, on top of a music magazine, we were actually a very funny magazine. We had people with good senses of humor, and we had some very funny bits. And, um, and then we just, you know, every issue we learned a little more and tried something different and just kept growing with it. Definitely. So how did you build an audience? Well... I, we, you know, we didn't really have much of one at the beginning, but because we were record collectors, uh, we knew all the record stores who would sell the types of music we wanted, so we would get them to carry a few copies here and there, and, and then uh, as the issues, uh, as we got to further issues, issue two, issue three, we would find stores in maybe San Francisco that would buy it, and then we'd get contacted by stores in New York who'd heard about it and wanted it. Uh, at some point, a a, a college, a university in Kentucky bought a subscription so they could keep it in their library, mm -hmm. in their archives, actually, where it still sits. And it is in a couple of other, uh, um, I think UCLA has a set of them as well. Kind of an odd <laughs> turn of events. Yeah, how does that make you feel knowing that people kind of wanted to read what you wrote? Uh, we were happy that anyone was interested, a college or the kid down the street. You know, anyone who, anyone who would look at it, you know, we, we were glad to have that. So um, who, like, influenced your writing? Like other journalists or artists? Again, I, I really was not much of a writer, but, of course, favorite music writers at the time would have been people like Nick Kent and Lester Bangs and uh, Nick Toshis and people like that. But, I, again, I, I would not call myself a journalist. I, I have too many journalist friends to do that. So let's see here. The tagline of Backdoor Man was for hardcore rock and rollers only. And would you say that the purpose of it was to kind of build a really passionate kind of community? Well, we hoped we would find like-minded people, and we did. But I think it was just something that one of us said one time and we went, put that on the cover. It was all just really that quick and that simple. It was, we didn't sit down and write out a business plan or even know how. Um, it just was all very seat of the pants, DIY. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know actually how we came up with that exact tagline to, anymore, to be honest. But it, um, we were, at the time, the big acts were people like Peter Frampton and, and uh, oh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and things that we cared nothing about. And the things that we did care about in the earlier, earliest days of the magazine was basically loud rock and roll. And whether it be older things like the Stooges or the MC5 or the Velvets or newer things or maybe Mount the Hoople, the New York Dolls, uh, and things of that nature. And... and um, it, I guess it was just a way to hope that someone would look at it and see the cover and go, I'll buy one of those. 
you know, I think that's really what it was. Yeah, and then, like, attending these concerts, did you make friends with some of the musicians? Uh, I was, I have been friends with a great many musicians over the years. Um, others I just met in passing, but I have, still have friendships with a great many musicians, and uh, some of them in the bands I've been mentioning, um, most of whom are no longer with us, but um, yeah, I did have some friends. Would you say you prefer like being on stage or watching a show? Uh, well, I do like playing, but um, you know, I know what I do. I'd rather go see somebody do something I've not seen before. That's a really great answer. And so Backdoor Man did eventually stop publishing. What challenges kind of caused that to happen? Well, as we got more professional, and we did, and as we got, it, basically it became a full-time job for someone. One of us had to take it on as a full-time job with no pay. We just, we, we couldn't, we didn't make any money. We never made a penny. Anything we made went right back into the next issue. So it became a full-time job, and people had moved on to uh, one of us, one of the writers became a writer, a uh, music critic for the Los Angeles Times, and the other one, another one was managing a band, and people who were moving on in their lives to other things, and none of us could afford to take it on, to, to just carry the load for free. Definitely, and so Backdoor Man also released some records. How is releasing records different than releasing a magazine? Well, we knew more about records, and how to have them made and how to have them distributed than we knew about magazines, which was nothing about magazines when we started. And there were bands that we liked that, um, and at the time people were, bands and, and labels were putting out very small pressings of local bands, uh, whether they were punk bands or power pop bands or rockabilly bands or whatever they may have been. And um, there was a band that we really liked called The Pop, and I thought, if we don't put a record out by them, someone else will, and they'll do it wrong. And so three of us that worked on the magazine got together and put a, a label together. And it was the same thing as, as with the magazine. We put out one. The money from that afforded us, uh, allowed us to put out the next one, and et cetera, and et cetera. And, and then we, at some point, it just became one more thing to do so that it, that it was that was more of a sideline just something to to have fun with and we did it and when it went away I don't think any of us was too heartbroken yeah but it's great that you were able to support things that you enjoyed and kind of spread it to a bigger audience indeed well and and you know a couple of those bands were able to uh, you know get contracts uh, from beyond that and, and do something so hopefully we had a little bit of a hand in that for them Definitely. So throughout your career, you've worked with bands. Um, one of them is the Wig Titans. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Uh, that was a, a band that um, the two of the members uh, who are a married couple, Paul and Mary, Paul uh, Terrio and Mary Fleener, are friends of mine from the days of Backdoor Man. And uh, we had played in bands from the time I was 16 until you know, just not that many years ago when we did the Wig Titans, I guess it's 20 years ago now, but uh, we got together one weekend just to get together and we were playing guitars and it sounded really good and then when the bass player showed up and it sounded even better and then we found a drummer and we just kind of, we had never planned on being a band, but we became one and then we never planned on playing live, but we did a lot. Uh, mostly in the San Diego area, and we had never planned on putting out a CD, but it all just sort of, again, it was not much, not different from the magazine, just a very DIY, and it, it turned into what it turned into. And how did you come up with that name? Well, I, I won't mention the gentleman's name, but I have a good friend who's a little tightly wound. And another friend was telling me about a situation that this first friend got into. And he got to the part where he said, where he's telling me, like, this is where he got, where the, this gentleman got very tense. But he didn't say he got very tense. He said, oh, and this is where his wig tightens. And I went, ooh, wig tightens. You could spell it the other way. What an interesting name. Uh, and I always, I always file away band names in my head when I think of them. 
And when we had this band, we couldn't think of a name. And finally, I came. I said, "Oh, Wig Titans," and it stuck. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I have a book of how bands came up with their names at oh, home, and some of the stories are just crazy, but they can come from anywhere. Indeed, uh, and that was just a, a funny joke, a funny line that someone said, and I realized changing the spelling made it even funnier. Yeah. So. Um, the Wig Tines album from 2002 is titled The End of the World. Would you say that urgency is something you try and capture in your music? Um, you know, when, when I'm in a band doing original songs, and in that band I wrote about half of the songs and sang them, um, you know, you, I write what I, whatever comes to me. Uh, the name of the album came from, that was the name of one of the songs on the, on the album written by uh, Mary. And um, it just seemed like a good title. Yeah. So how does it make you feel knowing that someone has a CD of that album listed on eBay? Because I actually looked up the album and I saw that someone was still sharing it today. So I thought that was pretty cool. But how does that make you feel? Well, you know, it, was, it did not sell a lot by any stretch of the imagination. So if anybody's out there listening to it, you know, bless them, <laughs> you know. It's a, and it's a good record. People should hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So how has your career evolved, and what other things have you done besides music? Well, I, did never, I never did have a career in music. Um, I've been around it basically my entire life. Um, sometime in the 80s, I got into the very early days of the computer business, uh, home computers, as some of you may know, we didn't always have them. Uh, and when it first started out, I got into that business, and that um, was ex exciting at the time. And uh, I got into that, and then eventually figured out I was very good at sales and became a salesman in the food industry, in the restaurant industry, and then eventually owned my own bakery. But through all of that, I played in bands and, and uh, continued to collect records and listen to music and see live acts and everything. So it's... Uh, an interesting journey. Yeah, what did you sell in your bakery? We made cannoli shells for Italian. We were a wholesale bakery. We made cannoli shells for Italian restaurants and uh, and del Italian delis and things like that. So we never. It, it was a bakery when I it was called a bakery when I bought it, and I called it a bakery. But you don't bake cannoli shells; you fry them. So I guess calling it a friary is too much like a. Be, you know, with with a, a, like a, a religious uh, institution, so uh, it, it remained a bakery. But yeah, we made cannoli shells. Yeah, cannoli would be a good name for a band. And I, I think there might be one actually. <laughs> yeah. So, what are your thoughts about rock and punk music today? Um, punk music is now what it is. Uh, it's it's was codified a hundred years ago, and became. I mean, there are still some very good bands out there. It's not what I listen to all the time by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't listen to anything all the time. I listen to music all the time, but I listen to rock music. I listen to jazz. I listen to blues. I, I listen to, you know, just about a lot of power pop. Uh, I listen to a lot of kinds of music. Um, you know, when the early days of punk, that meant bands like it could be television or Mink DeVille or Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, for goodness sakes, were called punk, and they were the farthest thing from it. Uh, but it had more to do with just the style and the not wanting to be in the mainstream, whatever that meant. Eventually, then, then they came up with the phrase new wave, so that now you could move all the bands that didn't look like the Ramones out of that and, and have this section be called punk. Um, it really, they're all just kind of silly labels. M good music is good music. If you can write a good song, I don't care how you play it. If you can write a good song, I'll listen to it. You know, If you can't write a good song, I don't care what style music you play. I don't want to hear it. So would you say that throughout history, people have always kind of had to dig for interesting or different music? I hope so. It should be. I mean, certainly as when I was growing up uh, as a kid, like a child, um, AM radio was astounding. I mean, you could hear 
the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all and and soul music and uh, all of it on one station. <coughs> excuse me, which you, <coughs> you can't anymore. But and it's hard to for you know people your age who weren't there then. It's hard to realize what a revolution that was and how different things became once the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan and and all the acts that followed whether it be the Dave Clark Five or Herman's Hermits or Petula Clark or whomever it was. Um, so at that time, it was a bit easier to... F good music was right there waiting for you. You just turned on the radio. Then as radio stations became more uh, tuned into one thing, we're a rock station, we're a soul mm -hmm. station, we're the, you, the, then you had to start searching even more. Uh, but the best stuff is generally not probably going to be a hit. Or, or some of the more interesting things are not going to be a hit. And I still dig for old records. I still, to this day, find records from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 50s, 40s that, that I'd never heard before. Um, so I hope people dig, from, dig for interesting sounds. Yeah. Do you listen to classical music at all? That I don't. I, I've never really found much in there for me. Uh, but... Yeah, so I guess no. The answer would be no. Do you still listen to the radio today? Um, to a, to an extent, but it's it's just too hard. Uh, you can't. You just sit and push buttons in your car all day, hoping to find something good. So, and of course, now you know you can put a thumb drive in your car with eight hundred of your favorite songs on it and not have to deal with it. So, uh, but how, having said that, I do listen because that is how you find new things. Yeah. What I notice is that a lot of the time they kind of replay some of the same things and then like the new stuff's relegated to special shows and things like that. Well, and, and generally on any radio station in any uh, style of music, they have a playlist and if you listen for four hours, you'll hear the same songs over mm -hmm. and over again. The same Beatles song, if it's that kind of station, or Led Zeppelin or... or uh, you know, Billie Eilish, I mean, whomever it may be, it's, you'll hear those same songs over and over, and I like to hear new stuff. Yeah, and would you say that new doesn't necessarily have to be, like, new out today, but just something you've never heard before? Oh, indeed. Um, there's a, a, a very, an instrumental song that I really like called Harlem Nocturne, and, uh, it was written in the 40s, and uh, bands had hits with it in the 60s, and other bands did it again in the 70s and 80s, and it's just a very, uh, it's kind of a standard. And I went through a, a search, I, I listened to 40 versions of it, and realized there's maybe one bad one, it's that good a song. Uh, and going back into the 40s, 50s, 60s, jazz people, rock bands, anybody just, to, you know, who did this song? So I'm always, you know, looking for whatever I might be able to find. Definitely. And so considering today, have, in your opinion, have things like the internet helped to bring people together or have they kind of just served as a substitute for like a true community? Oh, I suspect it falls somewhere in between. Um, I don't, I'm not, uh, I mean, I certainly use the internet. I don't use a lot of, uh, um, I, you know, I don't, I, I've never been on Instagram or any of those things. I have Facebook friends here and there, but I came to that party very, very late. Um, and I'm sure that it, it certainly helps people get their music out there or their art or whatever it is they do. And as friends uh, post songs, you might hear something that you, you haven't heard before. So there's that part of it, but there's nothing, what can really replace face-to-face hey, let's put a band together or whatever it may be. Um, so I, I guess that it does a little of both. Definitely, yeah, and it's COVID definitely had a big impact on bands playing and getting out there. And, when, and everything in the whole world, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it very often people talk about that's the last act I saw before the, you know, the lockdown. And I can tell you what the last act I saw was, you know, I mean, we all remember, you know. Yeah, what was it like when you kind of realized that you couldn't see live music for some time? Um, 
well, you didn't know it was some time. You, well, it'll be two, three weeks. <laughs> who cares? You know? And then, okay, it's going to be a little longer. It's going to be a little longer. Um, you know, I, I was playing in a band. I still play in that band at the time. And we were just starting to, you know, get a little popular and, and be able to get gigs. And that went away. And then most of those clubs that we played at have not reopened. So there's less and less places to play. So it's it's had a big effect. It's on, again on everything in the world, every business, everywhere, but certainly on the music business. Definitely. So you mentioned that you enjoy listening to records. Do you use any like music streaming services? No, I do not. I have never used a streaming service. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I, yes, I, on YouTube, if I look something up, I need to hear this. It's very quick. I can do that. But streaming services, no, I have, I have more records that that I haven't played yet. That I for I could listen for months. So I um, I, it, there'd be no point. I, I barely have the time to listen to the things I I have. So. Yeah, and then in your opinion, are these terms that we've been talking about, like rock and punk, do they describe like a style of music or a mentality? Both, and probably a lot of other things, a lifestyle, uh, a way of thinking, um, you know, and, and, and I suppose in that community, so does polka or whatever it may be zydeco whatever it may be it's it's uh if you're into it if it is part of your lifestyle then yes it uh, punk and rock are not would mean nothing to the lifestyle of my parents um or many many people but if it is your lifestyle then certainly yes definitely so we've been talking about music kind of scenes as well what defines like a music scene in your opinion well Having lived through the scene in L.A. Um, and and having, of course, known about the scene in San Francisco in the 60s or, or, in, San, or in L.A. in the 60s or in Detroit, uh, various scenes that existed, you knew about them, but then one actually came up in L.A. Uh, and we were, my friends and I were there at the beginning of it and seeing all the clubs and everything. And it's, it's... Um, you know, it's like-minded people finding each other. And then as, as a club opens and bands can play and somebody else says, oh, I could do that. Let's open another club. Let's start a band. Let and so it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's an interesting thing that sadly, I don't know will ever exist in, in like in Los Angeles again because in those days you could get four or five people rent a giant house in Hollywood and park anywhere for free. And none of that exists anymore, and, and people can't afford to live in those places. So I don't know where the next scene will be in L.A. Hopefully one comes up, but I'm not sure where. It, I don't think it would be in Hollywood. It might be more in the Inland Empire or, or I don't know where, somewhere like that. And now, having moved to Ventura recently, there is more of a scene here. It's a smaller area, and people can find each other more easily, I think. And there are, and it's you can get from one club to the other in ten minutes. And so it's it's in, it's an interesting thing here to see that one exists. Yeah. So how can people support their local music scenes? Well, get out and see live music. Um, if they put out, you know, buy merch. I mean, that's really the whole thing. Buy merch. That's the only way they're going to make money. Uh, if you go to a show, buy a CD, buy a shirt, buy a poster, do something like that. Definitely. Or start your own band and be a part of it. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed our conversation. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm Allison Lack with ECTV. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Tom, for sharing your passion for music and wonderful insight into the development of LA's music scene. This has been ECTV. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.